Thank you, Jenny. So today we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Duncan Watson Perez, who is an atmospheric physicist who works at the interface of climate research and machine learning. After obtaining a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Manchester, he became a software consultant and provided data analysis for researchers across industry and academia. Since he moved back into academia, he has investigated the effect of anthropogenic aerosols on the climate. Using machine learnings to combine global aerosol models with novel observational constraints, he tries to better understand these effects, thereby improving projections of climate change. And finally, Duncan has been fostering the application of machine learning to climate science questions more broadly, and he is the course director of the IM I'm Marekli Innov Innovative Training Network, the convener of the Machine Learning in Climate Research Forum within the University of Oxford, and the co-host of the recent Climate Informatics 2020 conference. And with that, thank you so much, Duncan, for joining us today, and I look forward to your seminar. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tom, for the invitation, also for the, the kind introduction. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to, to be here and, and describe some of the, the work we've been doing in using machine learning to understand and untangle uh, aerosol cloud interactions. Um, I'm gonna jump straight into it because it's a, it's a fairly short uh, webinar. Um, throughout the course of the talk though, I, I will provide an introduction to what I mean by these aerosol cloud interactions and why they're important to understand um, uh, in their contribution to the climate and climate change. But then I want to, I want to focus on three specific kind of case studies. So I want to describe work we've done in emulating climate models, in uh, the supervised detection of specific phenomena in satellite observations, and then some, some really kind of cutting edge work in using unsupervised learning and causal inference to try and pick apart these interactions. And then I'll close with, a, with an outlook of where, where I feel this is um, in going in the near future. So aerosol and, and their interactions uh, with clouds are, are crucial in trying to determine something called the aerosol forcing. And this, um, in simple terms, is the effect on the top of atmosphere radiation bullet budget due to the change in aerosol and their emissions from a kind of pre-industrial state to the present day. Um, and this, this kind of schematic from our recent review paper demonstrates some of the complex ways in which those emissions from large industry and shipping and transport and other um, other anthropogenic sources can influence the atmosphere and change this top of atmosphere budget. Um, a little bit more concretely, we can break down this, this forcing, this um, top of atmosphere radiative effect into a direct effect. So the um, scattering and absorption of incoming solar radiation primarily um, by aerosols back to space and that in parts of cooling on the atmosphere. But there's also this effect through this interaction with clouds. Now, um, if you just imagine for a, for a minute a kind of unperturbed cloud that is in this pre-industrial atmosphere, the water droplets nevertheless condensed on some form of aerosol, some condensation nuclei provided uh, by sea salt or other natural sources. If we introduce more aerosol into the atmosphere, then for a given amount of cloud water, we will provide more nuclei for the water to um, seed and, and tend to generate a larger number of smaller cloud droplets. And this so-called Toomey effect increases the brightness of clouds, thereby imparting a further cooling on the atmosphere. So it reflects more sunlight back to space and, and imparts a larger cooling. This also has microphysical effects on the development of the clouds and can suppress drizzle uh, and increase the liquid water content of clouds. And it can also increase the cloud lifetime, so the cloud might live longer, um, in part due to this drizzle suppression. Um, and the, the kind of forcing, so we measure forcing in terms of the, the watts per meter squared change at the top of the atmosphere. Um, and these changes are very uncertain. So the even in the direct effect, there's a, um, a fairly large uncertainty in terms of the absolute values of, of what that could be. So negative means a, a cooling effect. Um, and uncertainties of, of nearly a watt per meter squared in both these um, indirect, uh, indirect effects, these Toomey effects, and also the li so-called lifetime effects. Now, to put that into context, the um, present-day CO2 forcing is around 1.5 to 2 watts per meter squared. So um, 
there are obviously many other greenhouse gases and forces, but but this uncertainty in the aerosol forcing is an important part of trying to close this kind of present day forcing budget, if you like. Um, I will just note that although the absolute values of the forcing due to the scattering absorption is smaller than these other terms, because they all all these other um, effects scale with the the number of aerosol, the relative uncertainty of this is is um, contributes around twenty five percent to the total uncertainty. Um, and this uncertainty in the forcing, this uncertainty in knowing, you know, what the, the instantaneous effect at the top of atmosphere is due to, for example, aerosol in this case, um, leads to uh, differences in terms of the temperature changes we might expect towards the middle of the century. So this is just uh, a, an ensemble of predictions um, constrained on historical temperature using a simple impulse response climate model. Um, and if we if we play a game where we say okay we we really knew what the aerosol forcing was and we knew it's actually quite a strong aerosol forcing that for this single scenario would put us on a path um way out, out not way but out beyond uh, two degrees warming since the pre-industrial whereas if the aerosol forcing was actually quite weak then for this scenario we would actually only uh, we might be able to to keep to one and a half degrees so, and so this change in um Knowing this aerosol forcing would, would allow us to better know um, which of these trajectories we're on um, before we find out the hard way. So um, I want to, so that hopefully gives you some motivation for, for why I'm interested in, in aerosol and, and in particular their interaction with, with um, clouds. Uh, and I'll, as I say, now dig into some, some concrete case studies of where we've been using machine learning to try and improve that understanding. I suspect in this audience, I don't need to dwell on this, but I just want to briefly kind of uh, summarize for those of you who, who maybe don't use climate models very often. We have to discretize the, the uh, earth and the atmosphere in particular in order to solve the large scale flows in order to, and that we can only do that to a certain resolution of around hundred kilometers if we want to integrate these equations out to climate timescales. And that means any processes which happen on a scale smaller than that uh, are unresolved, and so the, the, they're parameterized. And um, as has been shown before, and as I reiterate in a recent perspective paper, the model uncertainty, so uncertainty due to these parameterizations and other uh, structural uncertainties in the model, can contribute a large proportion of the uncertainty in temperature out to, particularly by the middle of the century. Once you go further out, then the scenario uncertainty, so uncertainties in the emission pathways and things like that become more important. But um, this is another way of, you know, reiterating that that importance of the, the uncertainty and amongst other things, the aerosol forcing in these means. Okay, now I, I really like this uh, from, from Tom's recent uh, chapter on, uh, on cloud machine machine learning for cloud physics so I, I want to to borrow this for a moment because the work i'm going to talk about isn't explicitly on here but it does fit into this um narrative if you like or this way of thinking about how uh, how machine learning can can contribute to to some of these problems so we have increasing physical structure coming towards us and interpretability to the right now what what i'm going to describe here is is a form of parameter estimation so i want to better estimate what the parameters that go into our model are um, and I, I do that using Gaussian process emulation, which isn't explicitly on uh, on Tom's graph, but for me is is has high representation power and is in my mind more interpretable than than something like deep deep neural networks. And we use that, as I say, to explore parametric uncertainty. Now I'll, I'll walk you through what I mean by that. So if we think of a climate model as a really complex function of some input parameters theta that that produces some output y and i appreciate this is a very very abstract notion but but theta here could be um emissions they could be physical parameters in our parameterizations or they may be scalings on on processes which we have very little understanding of and the outputs are, are generally high dimensional maps of the quantities of interest such as aerosol optical depth now what we really want to do is use observations which I'll denote y zero here, in order to better inform our choice of these parameters. Now we can frame that in a Bayesian way and, and defer to Bayes' law and, and frame it as wanting to know what the posterior distribution of our parameters are given some observations. And that is proportional to this likelihood times our prior. 
we can't integrate this because you know this is shoving a lot of complexity under the carpet but y is very high dimensional theta is high dimensional um, and in general there are many uh, latent variables which i haven't even included here but we can sample from it so we can run off our, our climate model f um, and sample from this likelihood but in practice we need so many samples of that in order to approximate this integral that we use a surrogate model or an emulator to approximate that forward model and allow us to perform this this Bayesian inference so if we just think for a moment of, of, a, of a really simple example here I'm showing a, a two-dimensional slice through a three parameter experiment so we ran three different parameters controlling the uh, absorption aerosol optical depth in this case so that's our y this is a global mean so it's just one number in this case against three different parameters in our global model one that scaled the emission of black carbon which is a principal absorbing aerosol one that scaled the absorptivity of black carbon the imaginary part of the refractive index and one that scaled the removal which isn't shown on, on this graph and we sample that three parameter space using Latin hypercube sampling, and we generate our training data set. So we run the climate model, in this case of around 30 or 40 times, to create uh, samples, which we can then fit our Gaussian process emulator through. And once we have that, then we can densely sample this space in order to determine what the uh, what the correct, sorry, what the correct values of these parameters should be given some observable uh, AAUD in this case, so our Y. And so conceptually, you know, if you imagine we observe an AAUD of four times 10 to the three, we cut a slice through this plane and we're left with a, a reduced parameter space um, along some, some slice of, in this case, the covariant parameters of emissions and absorptivity. And then we bring in other observations to, to hopefully further cut down this parameter space and indeed that's what we've done in in recent work so we explored a, a large 30 parameter ensemble so we perturbed parameters to do with emissions of aerosol the uh, microphysical properties of aerosol aging and removal and also some cloud microphysical properties in order to determine reduced uncertainties in both this direct effect which was in a paper published uh, on the left here and also in the Tumi effect, so this change in droplet number, which was a, a, a PNAS paper by uh, Isabel McCoy uh, and myself and others. And so we we essentially, from this uh, large parameter space, which I show in the contours here, which is the original on emulator space spanning all possible parameters, we apply some observation in order to get a reduced um, posterior distribution on possible parameters and, and therefore a reduced uncertainty in, in the aerosol forcing in our in our GCMs. Um, I've developed an, a, a framework for doing this efficiently with with large climate model data sets. This is not a particularly new new approach, this this surrogate modeling uh, using Gaussian processes for inference, but there are particular challenges with climate data, not least the high dimensionality that make it um, that this this tool helps to alleviate. And there's also an online inference package so it performs the rejection sampling that we use in order to generate these posterior distributions and it does that on the gpu so it's able to to do that very quickly and that's that's up on github and there's a, there's a gmd paper coming um but in my mind what that allows us to do is to get at particularly these first two uncertainties this direct effect and this uh this tumi effect because those uh are in a large part parametric uncertainties in in our gcms one thing it doesn't necessarily help us with, the way it's, that problem is framed at the moment, is something like the cloud lifetime effect, where actually the, the structural uncertainties in the model play a large part. Um, so the fact that we just can't resolve many of the, particularly in stratocumulus, the clouds and the, the uh, cloud microphysical processes which control their sensitivity to, to change in droplets. And so there we defer to, to observations of, and observational studies. And I introduced this second part where we detect particular cloud phenomena in, in satellite observations in order to try and inform some of these questions. So the particular clouds I'm interested in here are the stratocumulus clouds, which tend to form off the cold upwelling regions of the, um, to the, to the east of the, our ocean. So the west coast of the US and South America and uh, Southern Africa as well. 
and we'll look for a particular form no phenomenon known as pockets of open cells. So these are regions of closed stratocumulus cloud deck, which spontaneously open into open cellular convection. So there is a, a phase transition, if you like, between this closed cell convection to this open cell convection. And you can see that there is a, a stark change in albedo because the, the closed, sorry, the open cell clouds obviously have a much lower cloud fraction and reflect a lot less of the sunlight back to space because you can see straight through them to the dark ocean surface. And it's been postulated that aerosol effects or changes in number droplet may affect the development of these because um, they're thought to form through precipitation processes which these aerosol perturbations might inhibit. So a student, a uh, master student of mine, Sam Sutherland, trained and developed a machine learning model, which is essentially a, a ResiNet model, which he adapted slightly, um, to enable us to detect these. So on the uh, left, we have a, a composite input from, from MODIS RGB satellite imagery. And in the middle here is a, the hand-logged mask, which we used to train the model. This one actually was, was held back for test. But you can see that you know, this structure, um, this open cellular structure, which we see here, which is quite distinct in pattern from the um, from the cumulus transition, which happens here to the north. And it's masked here. And having trained the model and developed the model, we were able to, to get it to produce masks, which look uh, very reasonable. And so this was this is what the, the final model would predict for this given the image on the left. And as you can see, it does a very good job of picking out this complex structure. The only slight difference is probably in this top left corner where it, it decides that this region is, is still a pock or pocket of open cell, whereas Sam decided it wasn't. And I think there's some, some ambiguity in there, which is probably, probably fair enough. But we were, we were pleasantly surprised that it was able to pick out this, this texture of the open cellular cloud um, as distinct from this, as I say, this cumulus clouds, which would have been very hard to do any other way with than, than machine learning. And, and by performing inference over um, hundreds of thousands of MODIS images from the NASA database, um, we were able to develop the first database of these phenomena in each of the, the main cloud uh, stratocumulus cloud decks. And look at the, the density of where they tend to form, both in terms of their spatial density and also their temporal frequency. We can see that in the Peruvian case, they tend to form at the, the peak of the climatological stratocumulus regions, whereas in the Namib Namibian case, they tend to form towards the edge of the stratocumulus deck. And this has been noticed as well in recent studies, which focused from the oracles and clarify campaigns on this region. Um, and a recent paper actually posited that this, this may be due to biomass burning aerosol originating from, uh, from Africa. Further, given this kind of detailed mask that we're able to obtain, we can form composite POC. So we can form composite um, statistics about these uh, objects. So we, we take the, an outline of, of the POC and we um, expand it and uh, dilate it and we also uh, make it smaller so that we can calculate, for example, properties like the cloud effective radius, um, so effective drop size essentially, of the clouds as a function of distance from the edge of this uh, POC boundary. And then we can, um, so if the boundary is this zero line in the middle and going out from the POC is to the right and into the POC to the left. Here I'm just showing cloud fractions to kind of demonstrate the principle. Um, and you can see quite clearly that as you go into this POC, as you would expect, the cloud fraction drops quite markedly. Um, and outside it's quite high because they're surrounded by these closed cell stratocumulus clouds. Now this is, as I say, quite straightforward, but then we can also look at these microphysical properties such as cloud effective radius, and we see that this increases quite markedly as we go into uh, the POC. So as you go transition to this open cellular clouds, we see a marked increase in the cloud effective radius, which demonstrates larger droplets um, and hints to the precipitation processes which we believe drive that, that transition. Another interesting thing to note is, is just how similar actually these, these pox are in, in the different regions of interest. So the Namibian, Peruvian, Californian are each of these different colors and their behavior is, is very similar across the regions. Um, the next steps for this are actually tracking the development of these pox in time. So here we're using a, um, we actually trained a machine learning algorithm to 
to produce uh, fake RGB images 24 seven. So trained on near infrared satellite imagery, uh, actually infrared satellite imagery, we can generate RGB satellite images, which we can then feed to the POC tracker to POC detection to track the POCs uh, through their lifetime. And we're currently studying the processes which drive their formation and, and subsequent dissipation in, in time. Okay. Um, and, and by studying that and looking at the number of POCs and where they form, we, we suggest that that particular cloud phenomena probably doesn't contribute a large forcing in effect due to this lifetime effect. The, the, they're just <laughs> okay. Now that that kind of um, just looking for looking for these phenomena hides a lot of uh, details about the microphysical processes and what what might be driving that. So there are large scale meteorological drivers which are probably the first order um, controls on on their formation. And so what we would really like to do is dig into the causality. Um, and this 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 section refers to a project which I was um, which I was lucky to lead this summer or last summer now um, by four four machine learning researchers who were involved in a frontier development lab summer project. Um, Matt Krishna and Matt Christensen were also supervising this, and I, I was supervising that. And they did so in just eight weeks. They 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 did this work that I'm going to present you, and we set out to answer a fairly simple sounding question of how do aerosols influence transitions between different cloud types. Um, and now specifically, we're looking in this region here in the Southeast Atlantic, and we want to know, we want to understand this, this transition in more detail from closed cell to open cell and then into cumulus. Now, this pathway, that, that, that effect as framed sounds quite, quite straightforward. But as I hinted to before, that actually only happens through a change in, in droplet number. And that has quite a complex interplay with the um, cloud microphysical properties, in particular, the onset of precipitation and the um, entrainment, both in the sides of the clouds and um, in the top and bottom of the clouds. And this all happens in the context of the large scale meteorology. And so any effect of aerosol on cloud type must go through these processes, some of which we can't observe, so we, we, you know, satellites just aren't able to resolve or or spot any of these things. And so, how do we how do we determine what what this total effect is? Um, the first step is defining what we mean by cloud type. And actually, here we developed an unsupervised learning technique that would allowed us to to define these types. So here on the left, I'm showing trajectories. We sampled a hundred thousand different air mass trajectories over the Southeast Atlantic region. And for each one, we set up a, I forget the size now, I think there are 128 by 128 pixel um, uh, boxes which followed each air mass um, and used this unsupervised cloud classification technique to give us trajectories of cloud type over time as a, as a function of area in this image. So we now have uh, 100,000 trajectories of cloud type over time. And we use a, uh, a, a backdoor criteria and a causal approach, which allows us to determine the probability of a given cloud type at time t, given the, a change in droplet number and some associated meteorology. So given that we change uh, droplet number at the start of our trajectory, which is what we assume in some aerosol perturbation, um, and some evolving meteorology, what is what does the evolving um, cloud type look like? And we can we can actually write down a, a, an expression for that. And we trained an RNN to enable us to sample from this likelihood and generate trajectories which answer that question. So here we have one particular trajectory which transitions from um, closed cell, I'll wait for it to start again, um, so it starts this cloud cell kind of uh, brown class transitions to open cell and then breaks up into broken cumulus as it transitions out into the Atlantic. Um, and this, I just have to move the, the other people. So, um, so this trajectory was for an initial amount of, uh, sorry, initial cloud droplet of 50 drops per cubic centimeter. 
what this approach allows us to do is ask the what if question. It allows us to say, well, what if there was an anthropogenic perturbation that meant the ND was a much higher number, something like 500. Um, and in that case, you can see that this open cell transition um, lasts much longer. There's a much reduced, um, uh, sorry, there's a, a prolonged period of open cells um, and therefore a delayed transition out to the broken cumulus. And that therefore speaks to the potential for a large lifetime effect, because if this organized cellular convection is able to persist for longer, then the, um, the albedo is likely to be higher integrated over time. And I, I find this, this um, approach really exciting because it allows us for the first time in observations to be able to play this kind of what if game to say, what, what if we change the, the ND in, in a consistent way? And as I say, that, that this work seems to suggest that particularly in these stratocumulus regions, this transition um, could be could lead to a, a fairly large or towards the larger end of this uncertainty range. And this corresponds to some modeling work, which also came out recently by Tom Gorham. So to, to summarize, um, I've hopefully demonstrated, you know, some of the machine learning techniques that we've used to create climate model emulators for parameter estimation and, and constraining uncertainty in, in the models that we use. But I've also shown how deep convolutional neural networks can be used, developed for detecting and tracking these POCs and, and also ship tracks, which I haven't, I haven't talked about in this talk. There's ongoing work to detect and quantify the changes of aerosol that they're causing on the prevalence and properties of different clouds. Um, and, and excitingly, I think, may allow us to discover new science. So we're not, we're not doing supervised training. We're not um, putting the physics in there. We're able to actually um, uh, learn the process level physics from often noisy and incomplete data. So um, in, yeah, as an outlook, I, I'm really excited that, that both um, the, the opportunities that climate science can offer machine learning sciences um, and also vice versa for the opportunities that machine learning might allow us to unlock in some of the questions we're facing in climate science. Um, I think a big aspect for this for me is in terms of um, engaging the community. So we have a machine learning climate research forums I mentioned in Oxford um, and, um, and and through this this uh, this forum, Clivar, and, and many others, climate and informatics and, and others. Um, and I think keeping that conversation going is, is key in order to enable us to best learn from the machine learners and, and also vice versa. So I'm excited to, to have talked you through this and I'd be very happy to, to answer any, any questions you might have. Great. Thank you, Duncan. So a reminder to our audience, if you have a question from him, you can use the uh, raise your hand button. Um, so that you can unmute yourself and ask him the question out loud, or you can type your question into the chat box. So I do see a couple questions in the chat box. Um, one from from Marcus. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Marcus Van Leerwalke. Um, he asks, when performing parameter estimation, how do you address observational uncertainties? In particular, do you account for the possibility that model error may be much larger than known slash assumed observational uncertainties, even for optimal parameter values? Does GP uncertainty provide help here? Right, absolutely. Yes, it, it's uh, a key component of the Bayesian inversion that we do. I might, let me just see if I have a slide. Right, oh, there you go, perfect. So um, in order to, actually perform this this sampling which I, I discussed I, I refer to it as rejection sampling other people might call it approximate Bayesian computation essentially what you do is you draw samples from your prior and you, you compare them to some distance metric in this case we use a standardized Cartesian distance so we say if our observations are um, within okay so if, if the absolute value absolute distance between our observations and our emulated uh, climate model output is is above some threshold then we accept it um, and we can make some approximations about the shape of that that distribution but we normalize that by the the un, by a few uncertainties so the fact that um so a we have the emulator uncertainty as exactly as you pointed out um we also have to approximate observational uncertainty and in practice that can be quite difficult uh, we don't always have very accurate estimates of that but there's also structural uncertainty and so 
um, yeah, we we have to we have to approximate that and come up with some sometimes a bit hand wavy approximation for what that might be. As more models perform these perturbed ensembles, then actually we can then start to get a handle on what this structural uncertainty is. Because if you have two parameter ensembles from two different models, then where they overlap, you can be fairly confident that's parametric uncertainty, and where they don't, you know, that's structural uncertainty almost by definition. A question from Pierre Gentin. Very nice talk, Duncan. For the casual interference work, is the backdoor criterion verified since there are there are internal feedbacks related to this? Is it uh, it is really a directed uh, a so, sorry a cyclic yeah cyclic graph? Thanks for the great talk. That's a really good question. Uh, thanks, Pierre. So there is some uncertainty potentially around the the structure of the graph that allowed us to. Um, uh, write down this criterion. We have played around with some possible variants and actually they all pan out the same way. And I think that primarily is to do with the fact that we are assuming that this change in ND happens at the start of the trajectory. So you have this air mass that evolves over time and, and a, a, your cloud evolves with it, but we assume that the perturbation in ND happens at the start and then just evolves through the same processes that would drive um, you know your clean clean cloud you you could conceive of some some feedbacks which would which would uh, introduce a cycle and, and and break that um but it's something something we're exploring um yeah okay boundary layer feedbacks is, is certainly yeah yeah could be could be one of those but i i'm maybe not convinced that they pay at first order uh, role here, but absolutely something to explore. So, so actually, we now have a, um, a master's student working on on exploring the uncertainty in this and some of the approximations approximations we, we had to make. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a very good question. I'd be happy to chat to you about it sometime. Jesus, thanks so much. Uh, do we have any other questions? It's all super clear. Oh, may I just speak? Yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, hi, Duncan. This is Hai Long. Uh, very interesting work. So I wonder in your park detection and cloud type tracking algorithms, how, yep. how did you decide on the box size? Yeah, that was somewhat arbitrary and, and chosen by data um, limitations or, or data pipeline limitations. Um, we wanted a, a sufficient region to be able to determine the the type. And so that needs in order to particularly to pick out the organized convection, you need you need enough cells essentially to be able to discern that. Um, the yeah, so it's big enough to discern the cells and small enough that we can cope with it basically was the, the criteria. I think actually in follow-up work in order to get the first paper out and be a bit more uh, robust in terms of what the scientific results are, we'll, I think we're going to skip the typing and just focus on like an average cloud fraction over this region because the, the unsupervised classification here also brings in a layer of uncertainty, which, which is quite hard to validate. So while I, I like the unsupervised approach for, um, for labeling different types in a, you could argue, um, objective way, it, it's not very interpretable. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think we'll move to a simpler metric for, for the first paper, at least. Thanks. Are those uh, cloud scenes like every 15 minutes? This is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is from Severi. Uh, so it's every 15 minutes at something like three kilometers resolution. Okay. Thank you. I know a uh, question from Tom. You want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Thanks for a great talk, Duncan. Uh, my question was about the the second section of your talk. How exactly did you go from the pocket of open cell climatology to uh, the uncertainty on the repetitive feedback coming from aerosol force cloud lifetimes? Yeah. Okay. So that that's a little bit 
Um, so we we basically just worked out the so we knew the uh, spatial and temporal distributions of pox now given you know from from our database and we can work out the average albedo inside and outside the pox and so we said okay well what if aerosol were to close up all the pox right what would what would be so it's like a, a, an upper limit what would be the the total rate of effect and it came out at like 0.0, 0 two or three watts per meter squared or something so it's it, it's pretty small because they're although actually on any given day you can see one their total radiative effect is pretty small they're just not common enough to have a big effect okay got it thanks for clarifying any other questions on i mean on this pox stuff as well we also brought in for the final version of the paper, we brought in some Calliope and CloudSat data and looked at changes in the cloud microphysical properties inside and out, outside the cloud because we were a bit concerned that MODIS, th these retrievals of cloud effector radius in particular, might be contaminated um, by the, so in, in broken cells, the um, particularly the near infrared retrievals from MODIS can get polluted from, um, from surface emis emissions. And so uh, we brought in. A few different sensors. There's a lot of a lot of data to dig into, which is great. Give another few seconds to see if we have questions. Um, if not, we can head into the closed session. All right, I think you were really thorough with your talk, Duncan. So I think with that, we'll head into the closed session. So for all those people who are not part of the working group, thank you so much for joining today. Um, our next talk will be in two weeks and it will feature Marcus Rickstein of the Max Planck, Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry. Um, so thank you for joining. I will send out a recording once it is available. Um, so please kindly remove yourself at this point and working group members, please stay on the line.